Are you considering buying a rural property? This next series of three videos will give you the questions you should be asking your realtor or property owner before you sign on the dotted line. We can't possibly tell you everything you might need to know for a specific property, but these videos start from a beginning level, and you'll feel more confident in your purchasing experience if you take the time to learn some of the basics we'll cover here. Buying rural has many more pitfalls than buying a home in a city subdivision. And hey, we don't want you to miss the additional videos. All the information is important, but it's a lot to take in all at once. So like and subscribe to keep up to date with us. Okay, let's get started with part one. To begin, we start with a simple concept. Get a team of rural transaction experts when you think about buying a property. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I've seen beginners show up with their friendly city real estate agent to show them rural properties. The agent had zero experience with rural properties and the nuances of buying land. I cannot stress enough that having representation by someone who has done many of these types of transactions can save you a lot of headache in the long run. So whether your state uses attorneys for a transaction or real estate brokerage firms, make your life easier and come with knowledgeable people. I know most people will already know this, but I promise to start at the beginning and I'm just keeping my word. Enough said, we'll move on. The first set of property questions are about markers and boundaries. Ask, has a survey been done and are there property markers on each of the property corners? Knowing the exact boundaries of your property is the first step to knowing what you're buying. If a proper survey has been done, then property markers, usually metal rods or concrete monuments, will provide a physical representation of your land's corners. The metal type are most common. They're pounded into the ground and the top has a medallion with the surveyor's license number embossed on the top. Next to this, the surveyor will normally put a wooden stick to help you locate the metal stake with the medallion. Over time, the wooden sticks get knocked down, but the metal stake in the ground remains. Now here's a common misconception. Many believe that fences always mark the property line. However, that's not always the case. Fences can sometimes be misleading. They might be placed inside or outside of the actual property boundary line for various reasons such as convenience or terrain, or simply because one property owner wants goat fencing while the neighbor wants electrified fencing for cows. When that's the case, an owner might put a fence within their own property boundary to avoid confusion on who maintains and owns the fencing. Therefore, it's essential to have a professional survey done. This will not only identify the precise location of your property markers, but also provide you with a legal document that outlines your land boundaries. What can I say? Always ensure to check for property markers and not rely solely on fences. Progressing to another vital aspect, the subject of wells and well water. Assuming a well already exists, you'll want to know the well's productivity and the quality of the water. Water pollutants can travel long distances underground and the only foolproof method to know if the underground water is polluted is to conduct a lab test. A lab examination of the water will reveal the details about the water's chemical makeup, including any ruinous bacteria or pollutants or, as my wife fondly calls them, the yuckies. At first glance, an understanding of the report might seem daunting, but it's easy enough to read. A pertinent fact to remember is that the deeper you go into the ground, the purer the well water tends to be. This is because the soil acts as a natural purifier. As a fun fact, when drilling a well, your installer will put in piping with seals to keep any of the less pure shallow water from entering your water delivery system. Your well pump will pull water from the deepest, purest water table level and bring it up to the surface to the water lines feeding into your household and other areas. More shallow water can be contaminated, but if you go deep, the water is likely pure. Well drillers put the seals in as part of their routine, but good to know about this issue in case you get a lab report in the future showing your water became contaminated. You should ask, did the seal break down over time? Is contaminated shallow water getting into my water lines? Let's delve into the process of testing, where fundamental factors such as pH level, the presence of coliform bacteria, along with levels of nitrates and iron are evaluated. These factors offer a primary insight into the current quality of the water. Now there are three primary levels of testing for water quality. Can we get a drum roll? Up first we have the basic level costing around $160. It includes testing for all types of bacteria and metals. 
Next, we have the premium level at roughly $240, which incorporates testing for industrial carcinogens in addition to the basic level protocol. Last but not least, we have the ultimate level costing about $700, which includes testing for pesticides along with everything else. Despite being a bit pricey, it's highly advisable to conduct an ultimate level test if you plan to purchase a property. Now let's switch gears to some advanced tips. I strongly suggest walking the entire property foot by foot. Watch out for any signs indicating the presence of pollutants. I hate to alarm you, but I've encountered properties on the market where dozens of old cars leaking oil and fluids over years were hastily cleared before listing. Yeesh. This introduces the potential threat of soil contamination. Nevertheless, we're focusing on water, so let's just agree that laboratory testing will reveal if any contamination has seeped into the groundwater. Once you've secured that dream property and you've become acquainted with your well set up and environment, you might want to test at basic level on a yearly basis. See, stick around and you'll be a pro in no time. Oh, almost forgot. Ensure to check with your local Department of Health Services for a certified laboratory when choosing a testing company. An additional factor to consider is the well's productivity. In simpler terms, how many gallons of water it can yield in a minute. Domestic wells for household water are typically 50 to 300 feet deep. In contrast, municipalities normally drill down 500 to 1,000 feet in a valley area to reach a natural aquifer or water table yielding hundreds of gallons of water per minute. Water for the masses, right? Back to private wells. Private wells in a valley area may produce as high as 50 gallons per minute, while those in a more hilly or rocky area could be as low as 5 gallons per minute. 5 gallons per minute is considered the lower level for a household by the local environmental department. They base this on an average of 100 gallons per person per day. Our well, for instance, is in weathered bedrock and yields about 11 gallons per minute. It's okay. We're able to support two households, a yard, pool, garden, and a few visiting livestock from neighbors. We plan our pool, yard, and garden watering for the early hours to avoid having low water pressure during the day. I would say that's okay, but not ideal. However, when I consider the cost to increase it, I think, well, it's perfectly livable. It's essential to factor in any additional water requirements for livestock or agriculture, which can vary greatly depending on your location and setup. If we wanted to have our own livestock or grow an orchard, we'd need to add well water capacity through a large holding tank or by digging a second well for our property. Not going to happen in our case. We'll live with one well and make do. My wife says, that's the rural way, right? Note that we may delve into this topic in greater detail in a future video if our community is interested. Questions like how we eliminated the iron to have nice clear pool water, or the various ways to increase water pressure, or all the new low water gadgets out there. Since I worked in the water environmental field, we've tried most of them. Let us know your thoughts or questions in the comments. Over the course of time, especially in hot climates like our summers in California, it's important to monitor the water levels in your well. In our case, we've been fortunate to have a stable water level at approximately 90 feet deep for the past 20 years. However, for less fortunate property owners, a dried up well may involve drilling the well deeper or drilling a new well at a different location. Now for numbers, the cost of drilling a well ranges from about $25 to $50 per foot. A quick Google search shows the costs are fairly consistent throughout the country. The costs add up quick. Okay folks, looking at all that money and talking about water is making me thirsty. Next up is the septic system that consists of a septic tank and a leach field. First, the septic tank. It's an underground concrete tank buried in a deep hole in your yard. It's filled with bacteria that accepts all the used water and sewage from your bathrooms, kitchen, and laundry. The solids remain in the tank where the bacteria break down the sewage. Depending on the quantity your household is producing, the septic tank has to be pumped out periodically. In California, the septic tank must be pumped before transfer to a new owner. Okay, that's the solids. For the water disposal component, the liquids are sent via underground lines from the septic tank out into your land to dispense underground. With that information, you should ask, what size is the septic system and when was it put in? Septic systems are sized based on the number of bedrooms. Many think it is based on bathrooms because that's where the sewage is generated. Did you think that too? Well, no, it's the number of bedrooms. Local government regulations use the number of bedrooms to estimate how many people might be living in the household. 
They consider bedrooms a more accurate measurement of how large a septic system is needed. Note, in California, a bedroom is not a bedroom unless it has a closet. So if you go into a house with rooms lacking closets, be on alert. Did the previous owner try to skirt the septic system rules by building rooms without closets? If you suspect a problem, then you'll want to go to the local building department and pull the property file. Check all building permits related to the number of bedrooms and the size of the septic system. Knowing the size and age of the septic system is key as it can give you an insight into the property's plumbing history. An older system may need maintenance you can't see or even replacement which could be another expense. The size of the septic system also matters because it should be able to handle the waste produced by the household. Now let's talk about the leach field part of the septic system. This is the area where the wastewater from the septic tank is dispersed into the ground. The length of the leach field piping tells you its capacity to handle waste liquids. A longer leach field can handle more liquid, which is important if you plan on adding more bedrooms in the future. Also, most people don't realize the local county will require you section off a portion of your land for a replacement field in the future. The septic system, the septic tank and the leach field is part of rural living. So ask questions. Yep, you know what I'm going to say, it needs to be up to par. Now let's talk about easements. Are there any on the property? Do they fit with your intended use of the property? Easements are a crucial aspect to consider when buying rural property. You might be wondering what exactly is an easement? Well, an easement is a legal right to use another person's land for a specific purpose. For instance, utility companies often have easements that allow them to run lines through private property. Now why is this important? Imagine having the perfect spot for your dream home only to discover a utility easement runs right through it that allows the power company to put high power lines on your property. Well, I'd say that can be a real game changer. Or you might find an access easement that allows your neighbor to drive through your property, altering your privacy and peace. There are many types of easements and some can be problematic. So before purchasing, be aware of any easements on the property and how they may affect your intended use. The next question to ask is, is the property on a private road and who maintains it? This might seem trivial, but the answer can significantly impact your rural living experience. If the property is on a private road, it means that the road is owned and maintained by an individual or a group of individuals, not the local government. Now, why does this matter? Well, it's all about responsibility and cost. If the road needs repairs or snow removal, who's going to handle it? If it's maintained privately, is there a formal agreement set in place or is it an informal arrangement? Having a formal agreement can ensure that the road is regularly maintained and can prevent potential conflicts. On the other hand, an informal arrangement might seem more flexible, but it can lead to confusion and disputes. Knowing who's responsible for road maintenance can save you from unexpected costs and trouble down the line. Okay, that's part one done, folks. Thanks for watching. See you for part two of this series.